everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Secrets of the USMLE Step 2 CK Preparation Advice. Leading tonight's discussion once again is Dr. Paras Vakaria. He's going to introduce himself to you now. Paras. Thank you, Sean. Hey, guys. My name is Paras. I am a uh, current dermatology resident here in Dallas, Texas. Um, I originally graduated from pharmacy school and then went on further to do medical school. Um, I am also an RX coach with USMLE RX, so I work one-on-one -on -one with students such as yourselves to help prepare you guys not just for USMLE Step 1, but also the USMLE Step 2 CK, which as you guys know, a lot more value is going to be placed on that. So happy to help talk to you guys today about preparing for that exam. Here's our agenda. We did the introduction. We're going to talk to you about some USMLE updates uh, post-COVID. We're going to give you some Step 2 CK advice. We're going to show you our approach to questions, give you some question dissection tips, give you some study tips, and then we have our raffle and special offer, as well as, of course, a question and answer session. So we will be monitoring that question and answer box. Uh, and if we see any thematic questions that we think uh, the entire group will benefit from, we will address those later as well. So as you know, the US Assembly now, there are some updates to it. So we'll take a look here. As you can see, US Assembly step one is now a pass fail exam. The US Assembly Step 1 passing standard has also increased. So testing on or after January 22nd, the point the points is two points more. So instead of 194, it's a 196. So now if you went ahead and took your exam prior to that date, your score will be reported. So don't worry. But if you take it after January 26th, you will get a pass fail score. And of course, as you can see, the score uh, for the passing has gone up by two points. Uh, CVSEs and CVSSAs no longer report a three-digit score. They report the overall percentage correct and give you an estimated probability of passing step one. Uh, US Assembly step two, what we're talking about today, in July, it's going to go up by five points from 209 to 214. So that's a significant increase. And we're going to talk more about that and how that's going to affect all of you uh, in the future. Uh, Comlex, a level one, will go past fail May 10th. So that's that's happened already. So that is now pass fail as well. So with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Dr. Paris Vicaria and let him take it from here. Paris. Thank you, Sean. So let's go ahead and let's kind of talk about uh, the USMLE. Now, you know, in general, uh, the majority of questions that you're going to see are clinical questions, okay? particularly with step 2 CK. We'll talk about that. Okay? And the majority of these questions are going to be a best answer type question, one best answer, okay? Select the best test, select the best drug, things of that nature, okay? So you're gonna have to look in that question to not necessarily just come up with the diagnosis, but to then use your experience and your knowledge to then know what is the best next step, whatever that step is, okay? And we'll talk about that just a little bit. Now, a lot of these questions also have multimedia, okay? Especially as we're talking about step 2 CK. We have to learn how to interpret chest x rays, CT findings, MRI findings, ultrasound findings, um, a lot of things you would do on a day to day basis if you were in the hospital. You order a chest x ray for a patient who's short of breath, how are you going to interpret it, okay? And not necessarily just still images but videos as well. There can be videos of physical exam findings, so neurologic testing, okay? How do they respond to certain tests? There can be audio uh, multimedia as well. So if you were to place a stethoscope on someone's chest and you hear a murmur, how would you hear it? How do you describe it? What kind of murmur is that? So a lot of different ways that step two is integrating multimedia into their questions. So it's no longer just a text-based question and exam, you really do need to integrate multimedia into your studying and your learning, which is really represents medicine um, and, and how it's actually performed, okay? Now this makes up the majority of the exam. And as you can see, a lot of questions also have multi-step reasoning. And you've heard us talk about this a lot in previous question labs, but basically um, there are often multiple steps to a question. So you know, an example of a one-step question would be, hey, you know, what is the diagnosis in this question? So you just come up with the diagnosis. But they can add another step to it. They can add a second step that says, what's the treatment of choice? Or what's the diagnostic modality of choice? 
for this condition. And that adds an extra step. Okay? So you need to be able to answer each of those steps. Now, if we move on to the next slide, you can kind of see the transition between the different step exams. You assembly step one to step three. You can see that step one was very mechanism based. You know, we needed to know the, the biochemistry of things, the molecular biology of things, how things work on a pathophysiology level. As we start to get into step two and step three, we start to become more clinically focused. So we start to focus on diagnosis. What is the correct diagnosis? And also integrating management. Okay, step three is very management heavy, but you do also have management questions on step two as well. Okay, and that's really what it comes down to when we talk about clinical questions. Okay, so you need to know that these, as we move along in steps, we're progressing to diagnosing conditions using uh, diagnostic modalities and also uh, management options and therapeutic considerations as well. So if we move on to the next slide, here we'll kind of talk about the blueprint for step two CK. Okay, and you can kind of see here that it's really kind of scattered on a lot of things. You know, we're talking about diagnostic studies very heavily, diagnosing patients, what is their outcome, and you can see all the way through pharmacotherapy, clinical interventions, mixed management. So this is a test of diagnosis, but also management as well. Okay, now step three is very, very heavily focused on management, but there is management you need to know for step two as well. Okay. One of the other things about step two CK is, like we said, this is very clinically focused. So you were to see a patient in a hospital and any potential scenario that could arise from that encounter is potentially testable. So that includes things such as professionalism, things such, such as patient safety, learning and improvement. So how would you respond to an ethical dilemma? How would you deliver bad news? How do you, how do you deal with or how do you respond to a patient safety uh, event or a, me a medication error, okay? How do you deal professionally with colleagues and with patients? All of these things are gonna be um, heavily emphasized on step two CK. And as you probably have seen in step one material, that's also being heavily emphasized now as well, okay? Now, if we move on to the next slide, we're kind of delving a little bit more into step two blueprint, okay? This is talking specifically about which uh, subjects and the, the kind of the, the percentage or proportion of that that is on the step two CK exam. You can see this is very medicine heavy. Okay? The majority of step two CK is medicine heavy, internal medicine and all of its subspecialties, cardiology, GI, nephrology, endocrinology, the list goes on and on, okay? But as you can see, and as you also remember from your clerkships, a lot of important material in surgery, pediatrics, OBGYN, and psychiatry, okay? Now, some of those specialties that you might be wondering about, like neurology, that falls under medicine, okay? Dermatology, that falls under medicine. So you can see a lot of things fall under medicine. So it's important to know that the majority of this exam is medicine-based topics. So when you're focusing on what's the best way to get my score as high as possible, you really want to make sure that you know those medicine topics inside and out. Okay. And when we work with you guys as well, we also work to figure out where are your deficiencies, um, not just in these disciplines, but even within the sub-disciplines within that. Okay. So keep this in mind as you're going through your step two CK preparation. What are the heavily tested materials? So now let's talk a little bit about advice. What advice can we give you guys? about preparing for step two CK. So first, we talked about this a little bit, knowing the difference. You've just taken step one, maybe recently, maybe a, a little bit ago. But as you remember, a lot of medical knowledge, a lot of you know biochemical process, a lot of factoids, a lot of pathophysiology. And that exam, seven blocks of questions, and a little less number of questions than step two CK. You can see step two CK is essentially one block longer. And as we talked about, a much, much heavier focus on diagnosing the conditions that patients have and also managing the conditions that these patients have. Okay, so it's a big, big step from um, building that foundation that we talked about. So then you can go on and succeed when you're in the clinical setting. And that's what Step 2CK is really asking about. So 
So let's go a little bit more into that. So when we talk about building a solid foundation, very important to build for step two, CK, a solid foundation, okay? And the best way to do that is on the next slide. Use your clinical experience. You need to utilize your clinical experience to build that solid foundation, okay? Now, whether your clinical experience was very recent, you know, you're just doing it, you just finished it, finished it up, or even maybe a couple years ago, if you have, you know, graduated school and now you're studying for Step 2 CK, still, you need to draw back on your clinical experiences, okay? There's something called interleaved practice, okay? Interleaved practice is very important to consolidating knowledge and making things stick in your brain, okay? It's called interleaved practice. This involves making associations between patients you've seen and disease processes that you see. So when you see a disease, when you read about a disease, whether it's multiple sclerosis, whether it's Guillain-Barre syndrome, you can associate it with a patient that you saw and you treated and you diagnosed. So then when you are going through your textbook and your review material on that condition, you can associate that condition with the patient. And that helps you remember it so much better. That's called interleaved practice. And we recommend doing that as you go through all of the various conditions in these medical specialties. Okay. Now the next thing is as you know, if you are going through shelf exams, is you want to study very, very well for the shelf exams as they're happening. Okay. Now with step one, a lot of times the mentality was I need to really focus and cram for step one towards the end of my you know, first couple years of medical school. Okay. Unlike that, the best way to approach step two is to be studying as diligently as possible for each shelf exam so that when it comes time for your step two CK, you've already done so much heavy lifting and heavy learning. Okay. So the more diligently and hard you can study for the shelf exams, the better you're going to do in the end when you eventually take step two CK, okay? And what does that mean? What does that mean studying for shelf exams? Well, that includes, you know, at the end of a clinical rotation and during your clinical rotation, a lot of times you have exams either from your school or other institutions that you need to take. So you want to make sure that you, for each of those clerkships, that you are utilizing references, resources, review material, question banks, and you're studying for that shelf exam and preparing yourself almost to go into that specialty and practice that, okay? One of the other important things for building a strong foundation is Q-Banks. Again, with step one, a lot of times we uh, incorporated Q-Banks kind of later on in our study times. And that's something, you know, even when we work with students for step one, we say the earlier you start questions, the better. But with step two CK, it is very important that you incorporate those questions from day one, from each of those clerkships onward, okay? And it's important because it's really hard to try to assess your um, understanding and um, application of material until you do questions, especially these clinical questions. You know, if a question's asking you, which diagnostic modality do you want to do in this patient? You know, there's really no other way to assess if you know that or not, until you answer that question. You can read and read and read about the disease, but until you get asked that question, it's really hard to know if you understand what you need to do. So make sure you're incorporating it early and often all throughout your learning for Step 2 CK. Okay. Third, align study topics that correlate with your current rotation. So as we talked about, as you're going through your clerkship, your rotation, you want to align those study topics to correlate with what you're doing. So let's say you're doing your OBGYN rotation. Okay, let's say you're starting off initially with OB. Well, you would wanna then focus your OB-related topics with your rotation. Let's say you're doing more GYN, gynecologic uh, medical stuff, surgical stuff towards the end. Well, then you might wanna uh, push those topics towards the end so where they can kind of align. So when you're going home, you are reading and learning about things you just saw in clinic or you just saw and treated, okay? That really helps, again, with what we call interleaved practice. It's very important to really do that, um, to really help this material stick. And then lastly, as we talk about, 
it's always important to do self-assessments to see where you stand and see how you're doing. A lot of students are very hesitant to do that, um, but it's really important you do that so you can figure out, you know, where are your weaknesses within a specialty, you know, within the surgical specialty. Are you having an issue with pediatric surgery? Are you having an issue more with one specific type of surgery? Okay, so these self-assessments can make sure that you are um, that you've learned the material well and that you can apply it to clinical questions. Um, very important you do that uh, throughout your rotations and also as you get close to step two CK. There are a variety of practice practice exams um, and standardized exams you can take to help see where you stand in terms of step two CK. And as we all know, um, the score for step two CK is going to be very, very important now that step one is pass fail. So you definitely want to make sure you're utilizing those self-assessments appropriately to see where you stand. So let's move on to the next slide. You know, what if you are not a traditional student, you know, not on clerkships, um, you know, maybe you're an uh, international medical graduate, maybe for some reason you're not on clinical rotation. What can you do to help prepare for step 2 CK now that it, we know how important it's going to be? Well, just like we talked about, it's important that you create a study plan, just like you did for step one, okay? So you want to create a study plan going through those specialties and those disciplines that we talked about, breaking it down um, section by section and going through it just like you did step one, setting aside a certain amount of time for each specialty, for each discipline, doing a certain number of allotted questions on a daily basis. You need to have a study plan in place to approach step two studying. Otherwise, it gets very convoluted. Um, you can lose track of time. and and it's hard to stick to something if you don't have that plan, okay? Now, as, as we look on the next slide, we can also see um, it's important to know, like we said, the percentage of the exams. So if you're not on clinical rotations and you're not seeing patients daily, you know, again, what is the most tested area of the exam? And that is medicine specialty. So that's where you wanna focus on those specialties, on, on those areas to beef up those weaknesses, okay? That's where you're gonna get the best almost bang for your buck, but also the best chance to do well as well. As we talked about, one of the things you wanna incorporate in your study plan are review of material and practice questions, okay? So simulating uh, uh, patient encounters with practice questions is another way you can approach this. So if you don't have a real life patient that you can draw experience off of, you can do that with practice questions. So if that uh, patient, if you had a very interesting question about a patient with, you know, a very interesting condition, you can incorporate that question as your reminder, as your association for that condition. So you definitely want to focus on practice questions. Make sure that you're learning the material and applying it um, appropriately throughout your review period. Um, it's definitely important that you go through as many questions as possible. Um, you know, there are a variety of question banks out there for step one, step two as well. Um, and you want to make sure that you are utilizing as many resources as you can to really get as many questions in as you can, okay? Now, with step one, we know that review books, they're a little bit more focused. We know that, you know, first aid for step one is uh, really what a lot of students would call the Bible and, you know, UWorld and some other books as well. Now at step two, you'll notice that there's really not as much of like a, a one specific great book that covers everything, okay? And part of the reason is because a lot of the way that you learn for this exam is on rotations, it's in the hospital, okay? So you might see that there's more specialty specific review books. There might be a medicine review book, an OBGYN review book, but there's not really one great resource that covers everything together, okay? So a lot of times students will use questions, they'll pick a, a book for a specific topic that they need to work on, but really a lot of patients draw on their clinical experiences and their review and uh, the material for that specific specialty. Okay, so keep that in mind, that the, the, the game and the study plan is a little bit different for step two than step one. Now, if you're having a hard time creating a plan, if you're having a hard time coming up with even what resources to use, how to approach all of this, you know, we are here to help you guys. We, we have a lot of students that we uh, help tutor for step two CK, especially now as we talked about, it's, it's becoming so much more important. Um, so reach out to us. Sean will talk to you about that um, a little bit more as well.
and then um, we'll we'll talk a little bit about study study tips. So as we said, it's important to create that study schedule and stick with it. That holds true for really all aspects of of medicine, whether it's step one to step three, or even just you know residency or work after that. Okay, it is also important that you know as we talk about a lot of these questions now have multimedia. Um, so you don't just want to be reading from a textbook. You want to alternate the ways that you learn and the ways you study. You want to incorporate videos, pictures, audios, group learning, um, encounter situations, um, sample patient uh, questions as well. So alternate how you're studying to vary it up, to spice it up, but to also make sure that you are kind of getting a lot of that multimedia focus in there as well. Now, with a lot of uh, exams, you know, especially with step one, there are some things that we would call crammable, like biochemistry, uh, molecular biology, things like that, okay? With step two, not as much. You know, you could argue that a lot of it's just clinical information that it's kind of hard to, to kind of cram for, okay? That being said, you will notice within each specialty, whether it's internal medicine, whether it's um, pediatrics, whether it's psychiatry, there are things that are somewhat crammable that you definitely want to review at the very end because we often forget them. You know, the criteria, uh, the time criteria between different um, conditions such as schizophreniform disorder, schizophrenia, um, different personality disorders um, within pediatrics, um, some of the milestones, you know, what milestones should a six month old be meeting versus a 12 month old. Those are things that you'll notice as you're going through that are just harder to, to nail down. So you definitely want to make sure that you're reviewing that at the end as well. As we talked about, make sure you are focusing on high yield material and know what's high yield on the exam. And as always, as we at uh, uh, USMLERX talk about, it's always important to keep your mental health and, and, and wellness in mind as you're studying for this. The last thing we want to do and see is someone studying on physically and mentally and emotionally, you know, this is a lot of stress. It's a lot of pressure. So you need to make sure that you're building a good study plan that includes things like breaks, exercise, personal issues, okay? Be relaxed, be grounded, reach out to friends, family, support systems, us if you need. Um, you know, we're, we're in this together. All of you guys are in this together as you approach this exam. So make sure that you're allowing time for yourself and, and not to get burnt out over this. Um, and so I will pass it over to Sean. Sean's going to kind of go through a little bit about our question dissection strategies, and we'll kind of walk through that with some step two CK questions today so you guys can work through that with us, okay? Thank you very much, Paris. You know, before we continue, I do want to ask you guys a question. The question is, when are you taking step two? Are you taking it between June and August, between September and December? Or are you taking it sometime in 2023 or after? Please take a moment to let us know. Once again, we're going to wait until about two thirds of you have responded. If you weren't here earlier, we do have a very valuable raffle and a special offer for all of you in attendance. So make sure you stick around. And soon we'll get into some question dissection strategies and dissect some questions with you as well to give you some of that practice here tonight. All right, let's take a look and see when you guys are taking the exam. 49% of you are taking it really soon, right? In the next few months. A lot of you are taking it, you know, between now and the end of the year. <clears throat> and we've got about a third of you that are taking it sometime in 2023 or after. So once again, welcome to all of you. And we hope that this webinar will be of use to you and you'll get some valuable information as you prepare to knock step two out of the park. So some question dissection strategies, you know, we always want you to have an approach. When selecting an answer, we want you to utilize all of the information provided. And remember that each question is created to test a set of related topics and or content area. So keep that in mind, you know, there are different ways to approach questions. We have a way that we'd like to use, and we're gonna share that with you here in a moment. But you know, no matter what you use, it's important to be consistent. This way, you're not making, you know, you're not making mistakes that are avoidable, and you're approaching each question with consistency to remove some of those variables on test day that are likely to present, okay? Uh, when we say selecting an answer, you know, utilize all the information, you know, read that vignette, you know, don't don't skim it. You know, it's easy to overlook things when you start thinking too fast. Highlight what's important so it's staring at you in the face and you don't look it over because, you know, that one detail that you overlook may be the game changer for that question, okay? So our approach to questions, we're gonna 
show you here in real time as we dissect questions for step two. So our first question of the evening. As you can see here, the answer choices are not there and that is because we removed them. We did that by design and we did that because we don't want you to see the answer choices prior to you reading the question in the vignette. The reason for that is because oftentimes students will read, an answer, read the answer choices and the thought process will be guided by them or they'll read an answer choice that they're unfamiliar with and they'll start to panic as they're trying to answer that question. So we've removed those answer choices here for you today. And then what we'd like to do is read the lead in or the last sentence itself. And the reason why we do that is because once you know what the test writer is asking, you can pick up on all those relevant clues in the vignette and not overlook anything and also prevent yourself from having to reread that question and waste valuable time on test day. So let's go ahead and take a look at that, at, at that lead in. So the lead in is what is the most appropriate next step in management? What is the most appropriate next step in management? And then we want you to start to think about, you know, is this a one step question? Is it a two step question? Is it a three step question, right? And so when it relates to step one and, and sometimes even step two, you know, a step one question could be, you know, hey, what, a one step question could be, you know, what, what's the diagnosis? A two step question could be, what's the treatment for a diagnosis? Or a three step question could be, what's the mechanism of a treatment for a diagnosis? Now it's different for step two, but once again, similar framework, right? Is it a one step question, a two step question, or a three step question? And this way you can map those steps out in your mind which will help you stay organized and tackle that question successfully on test day. So now that we've read that lead in, let's go ahead and take a look at that vignette. A 73 year old woman comes to her primary care physician because of back pain. She has had back pain for several months, but it has become sharp and constant since she bent down to pick up a TV remote yesterday. She has no difficulty in ambulation, voiding or defecation. She has a history of osteoporosis and hypertension and takes lisinopril, and a multivitamin daily. She has a family history of osteoporosis. Her body max index is 32. Her temperature is 98.4 Fahrenheit or 36.9 Celsius. Pulse is 92 per minute. Respiratory rate is 19. And blood pressure is 128 over 85. Physical examination shows kyphosis in one location of the lumbar spine. Examination of the lower extremities shows that motor and sensory functions are intact. A lateral x-ray of her spine is shown. What is the most appropriate next step in management? Now, I want all of you to start thinking about the important clues in the vignette lead-in as I hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. And so uh, one of the things that, you know, as we go through these questions, as, as Sean mentioned, um, it's important to keep in mind what those important clues in the vignette and the lead-in are, okay? And, and so um, as you go through this question, you know, you really want to make note of what are those things that really should be sticking out to you, okay? you that you really should be taking home um, and, and, and using to incorporate, to come up with the correct answer in this question, okay? And so as you guys can see here, we have a question asking about the most appropriate next step in management. Now this question, as you can see, isn't just a one-step question. This is asking us the next step in management. So one, I think we've got to figure out what is going on in this question, okay? Um, what is the, the, the condition, the, the, the issue here? And then two, what's the next step in management? So you can see this is a management type question. So it's going beyond the scope of just knowing what the condition is, but what do you want to do in management? How do you want to manage this patient? And so then what we see here, um, if we move on to the next slide, we'll see there are answer choices that we work with. And as Sean mentioned, um, one of the things that we like to do when we work with students is as we go through those answer choices, um, and here we have a, actually a, a, a blow up of that image. So you guys can take a good look at that. Don't worry, it'll still be there in, in, the, in the question box uh, or the question screen. Uh, but when we work with students and we go through these questions, um, we recommend that you actually start at the bottom and work your way up to the top. Okay? So start with answer choice E and work your way up to answer choice A. And the reason we do this is because, you know, a lot of times we'll see students who start at the top, they'll see something they like and they'll select it without having gone through all the answer choices. So sometimes they'll get that question wrong. Okay, so we recommend as you go through those answer choices, actually starting at the bottom and working your way up to the top. So we'll go ahead and do that now. 
Answer choice E, surgical stabilization. D, bracing. C, administration of oral analgesics. B, administration of calcitonin. And A, administration of bisphosphates. So we'll go ahead and let you guys think about what you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. Thank you, Boris. The poll is open. We'll give all of you a few moments here to respond. Remember that there is no penalty for guessing on test day, so never leave a question blank. And if you're unsure tonight, don't worry. All your submissions are anonymous. Take your best guess, and then we're going to go over the correct and incorrect answer choices here in just a moment. All right, so there's responses coming in. It looks like, there looks like there's a clear favorite already. Let's see if it holds as we get more submissions. All right, about half of you have submitted responses. All right, well, let's take a look and see what all of you selected here. So the clear favorite here with 46% was administration of oral analgesics. 46% of you picked that. 24% of you selected administration of bisphosphonate. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. The correct answer is indeed C, and 46% of you got it right. So great job, everyone. But let's make sure we got it right for the right reasons. And also, you know, when you're doing questions, you also want to review why the incorrect answers are incorrect because you can learn from those as well. So let's tune into Paris now, and he'll break it down for us. Paris. Thank you, Sean. So, you know, hopefully you guys picked up that this patient was having chronic back pain, but it also kind of suddenly changed, okay? We know she has a history of osteoporosis, right? Um, and now she is having uh, a more acute on chronic, what we say, back pain, okay? You can see there in that x-ray that, you know, her spine doesn't really look too healthy. You can kind of see there that middle uh, vertebral body in the right smack dab in the middle of that image doesn't look like the one above it and doesn't look like the one below it. It looks kind of thinner, it looks uh, more so at an angle. And so what's happening here is this patient is actually having a fracture of that vertebral body, what we call a vertebral compression fracture. Okay? And you can see this in patients who have osteoporosis. So that's why it's important to catch an osteoporosis and do what you kind of prevent it and also treat it, okay? Now, as you can see here, um, the question is not asking about how do you treat osteoporosis, okay? Because if we were talking about how to treat osteoporosis, then we could talk about bisphosphonate. Then we could talk about calcitonin. But this is asking about management. So the 73-year-old woman comes into your office, asks to see you, and she's got back pain, okay? She's got this acute fracture. The next step in management is to help her with the pain. That's the next step. So these management questions are a little bit different. What do you do first? It's not saying, how do you treat the condition? What's the best overall treatment? How do you manage this patient when they're with you right then and there? You've got to help her with her pain. After that, you can talk about bisphosphonates, you can talk about calcitonin, you know, surgical stabilization if that's needed. Now, this patient seems to be doing well where they don't need surgical stabilization. You can see the motor and sensory functions are intact. Um, also, would less likely indicate the need for bracing. But the takeaway from this question, and one of the key things with step two, is managing these patients. But also, what's the first thing you do in management? versus what's the ultimate or uh, things you would do later on afterwards, okay? So great job coming up with the correct answer to this question. Well, thank you very much, Boris. Great job, everyone. Let's move on now to our second question of the evening. Once again, the answer choices have been removed. That is by design. And as always, we will begin with the lead-in. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial step in patient care? So. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial step in patient care? I'll give you guys a few seconds to think about how many steps you think this question is going to require. Let's take a look at that vignette. A 33-year-old Latino man comes to the emergency department because he has seen white patches in his mouth, as shown in the image, for the past week. On questioning, the patient indicates that the onset of the patches 
coincided with the completion of a course of antibiotics and corticosteroids for a recent cough and asthma flare. He also states that he used to smoke and previously had thicker white patches in his mouth that were difficult to scrape, but that those patches disappeared when he quit smoking about five years ago. He has not smoked since then. He says that because his uncle, who was also a smoker, died of mouth cancer, he is worried about developing mouth cancer. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial step in patient care? Boris. Thank you, Sean. So again, you know, now we've got one of those nice multimedia images in step two CK, okay? They're giving you a lot of medical history here. Um, they're giving you, you know, the questions that you would ask. So when did this start? These are questions that you would wanna ask. What's his history? Has he smoked before? What's his family history? These are all questions that you would ask a patient. They were in the hospital or they were in your clinic and they give you that information. So you wanna make note of those clues, okay? Now you can see here that this question is asking us about the most appropriate initial step in patient care. So I think we've got a couple steps here. I think one, we've got to maybe figure out what's going on. Um, and two, what would be that next step that we would take in managing this patient's care, okay? Um, again, keeping in mind initial step, okay? So make sure you get a good look at that Im uh, image or photograph, and we'll take a look at the answer choices. Once again, we'll start at the bottom, and we'll work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, superficial scraping of lesions and potassium hydroxide preparation. D, reinstitute antibiotic course. C, immediate course of nystatin, swish, and swallow. B, excision of all lesions. And A, allow two months for the lesions to clear spontaneously and schedule a follow-up appointment. So we'll go ahead and open up the poll. Go ahead and select what you think is the most appropriate initial step. and We'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Well, thank you very much, Bar. So here we go with our second question of the evening. The last answer choice got truncated. So um, it's super, E is superficial scraping of lesions and potassium hydroxide preparation. And answer choice A also got truncated. So that is allow two months for the lesions to clear spontaneously and schedule a follow-up appointment. So we'll give all of you a few moments here to respond. And as always, we will then review the incorrect and correct answer choices. All right. A few more seconds here, but half of you have responded. We'll give all of you Another moment or two. All right, well, let's take a look and see what you selected. It was a little close. 46% of you selected superficial scraping of lesions and potassium hydroxide preparation. And 41% of you selected immediate course of nystatin, swish and swallow. Let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is E. And 46% of you got it right, so great job. Let me hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, great job. Now, I think you guys are starting to get the hang of, you know, what you would want to do initially, okay? So hopefully you guys are picking up that this patient, you know, has has a something going on in the tongue, something going on in the mouth, okay? Not exactly sure what it is, okay? Now, when you see that, you'd want to think of a few things. That could be thrush or oral candidiasis. That could also be leukoplakia, white leukoplakia or oral cancer, okay? Um, one of the things, if you guys remember from step one, is leukoplakia is something that does not scrape off, while candidiasis is something that does scrape off, okay? Now, oral candidiasis is something that you can see um, hyphae if you were to do a KOH or potassium hydroxide preparation, okay? So in this patient, you wouldn't just want to do answer choice C. That was the second most highly selected answer, an immediate course of nystatin swish and swallow is assuming that this patient has thrush, okay? You don't wanna assume this is candida or thrush. You wanna confirm that first before you treat them, okay? You wanna be that great physician that is very thorough and says, let me make sure this is candida, let me make sure this is an infection before I give you an antibiotic or anti-fungal uh, or anti-viral um, agent, okay? So answer choice C is forgetting the fact that maybe this isn't thrush, okay? So what's that most appropriate initial step 
This question is not asking which of the following would do the best in clearing the tongue. The question is asking for the initial step you would want to take, and that is to come up with the diagnosis. And so that superficial scraping, that can tell you if it, if it does scrape off or if it doesn't scrape off. And that can give you some clues to if it's candidiasis or leukoplakia. And a KOH preparation could also tell you if it's candida as well, because you could see hyphae on that, on that preparation. That'll also give you clues as to whether this is candida. And then if it is, then you could go ahead and start NYSTAT, okay? But it's important with these step two questions to always keep that in mind. What's the initial step I need to take, okay? Now, the other answer choices, um, you know, this is not something you would excise, okay? Again, we don't know this is cancer just yet. We need to do our appropriate diligent workup to figure out what this is. Answer choice A, um, you know, you wouldn't want this to just clear, uh, hope it clears on its own and then bring them back. You would want to do something to figure out what this is, okay? Um, so another great question here that kind of highlights how step two uh, CK likes to ask their questions. Um, and I will uh, pass it back to you, Sean. Thank you very much, Boris. In the time, we're going to skip our third question this evening and uh, talk to you a little bit about Rx Coach, um, some more additional tips, and then, of course, do our raffle and special offer. So, you know, a lot of students, especially IMGs who felt that they were at a disadvantage for step one, may not feel like they have an advantage because of step two because they have more clinical experience. But remember, the passing score is also going up. So, you know, if you're going into a competitive residency or any residency, that step two score is going to be looked at very, very heavily. So, you know, it's very important to do really well on that because that is now the only standard barometer that we're going to have uh, for residencies to look at. So, if you need, you know, assistance, if you want to make sure you're putting your best foot forward, you know, come to us at Rx Coach. We're going to help you take the guesswork out of study, right? You're going to take an assessment, and then we're going to make you a personalized study plan based on that assessment. <clears throat> we're going to see what kind of learner you are, identify your knowledge gaps, identify your strengths and weaknesses, and make you a personalized study plan that way. You know, a lot of people say, oh, my friend did this, or I read this online, or, you know, my mentor said to do this. And, and they may very well be giving you what they believe is great advice. But keep this in mind, every student is different. Everybody learns differently. Everybody has different styles of learning. Everybody applies what they know differently and everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. And the cookie cutter approach doesn't always work for anyone. A lot of people take you know, USMLE review courses, which assumes that everybody is going to learn at the same pace every single day. And that's simply just not true. So what we do here is we create a pace and a study plan based on how you learn and what your learning style is. And then we help you identify your knowledge gaps and weaknesses, and we address those while simultaneously working on your test taking skills. And as a result, we've had a lot of success for, uh, 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 as a result of it. You know, four of our tutors took step two, sorry, but five of them took step two uh, in the last several months. And the lowest score in the group was a 265 or 266. So we have a very, very highly qualified group of Rx coaches that are here to assist you reach your maximum potential and get into that residency that you want. You know, you've come this far and it's all going to boil down to this. So if you want to, you know, make sure you don't take any chances, reach out to us at rx-coach.com. Schedule a free consultation to discuss the tutoring program. So when you book that free consultation, we'll talk about Rx Coach and what we can do to help you get to where you want to be. Okay. Once again, that's rx-coach.com. <clears throat> and of course, we're going to include all of our resources right, including our step two question bank. And remember, we recommend that you go through at least two question banks. That was study show. Study show they should go, to a, go through at least two question banks. You know, a lot of people say, I'm going to do the same question bank twice. Studies actually show that that is of no benefit to you. It's better to do new questions and unique questions than to repeat questions you have already done. So remember to try to do two question banks and not any question bank more than one time, okay? Now, as always, you know, we want you to stay connected with us, right? We're on YouTube where we post all of our webinars and all of our question labs. You know, question lab is something that we do every Tuesday at 8 p.m. So like we dissect the two questions today, every week we pick a topic and we dissect four questions. And in the chat box, Jeff dropped in that link. If you haven't come to one of our question labs, we've been doing it for over two years. It's completely free and we'll pick a topic and we'll dissect four questions. So this coming Tuesday, we'll be dissecting four questions on the topic of pharmacology. So once again, those videos are also available at YouTube. We're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, and we have a great blog at firstaidteam.com with a lot of great advice 
and a study planner too if you'd like to utilize it for, uh, for your study needs.